Good morning. Today we look at a few more aspects about the novel, The Color Purple. And uh, you know that this novel, you've heard about it, it's a novel that celebrates black women who challenge authority. So the story is about a woman named Celie and her sister, Nettie. So Alice Walker is trying to expose the prevalent patriarchy and how men dominate women when she writes this novel. So this novel, as we have already heard, is about the trials and tribulations faced by black women under colonialism and also black men oppression. And it is the journey of these black women, specifically Celie's journey to attain knowledge, identity and oppression. So we understand that the black women had a kind of double marginalization. They were victims of colonialism as well as they were victims of their own black men, right? So they were suppressed by the whites as well as by their own black men. So in this novel, we see how the main character protagonist, Celie, is raped continuously by her father, but she doesn't retaliate, she does not resist. She continues to suffer in silence. She's unable to express herself. She's unable to fight back. She has a daughter, she has a son by this father at a very early age, but both these children are snatched away from her. And later she's forcefully married off as a slave to a person called Mr. Dash. His name is Albert. She never utters his name in the novel. She always calls him Mr. Dash, right? And you see how Celie is forced, we have seen how Celie is forced into a loveless marriage, how she serves as a maid, as a worker, as a babysitter, and how she's treated like a full-time object for sexual pleasure. See, Albert had a son named Harpo. So he becomes her stepson. So when, uh, uh, see, when Harpo gets married, the woman who comes into the home as Harpo's wife is a very confident woman, right? She's Sophia. And she's unlike Celie. She's very demanding. She always demands attention. Sophia is a very fearless woman and she does not, she would not let any man dominate her. She remains undefeated until she is forced to become a slave to a white couple that is the mayor and his wife. But even there, you know, Sophia's sisters, they help her to escape this unhappy marriage and they help her to take her children with her. But Celie could never do that. You know, Celie could never do that. So all throughout the novel, one thing that never lets hope die within Celie is her love and her concern for her own sister, her blood sister, Nettie. Albert, who had earlier wanted to marry Nettie, threw her out of the house after she refused to respond to his sexual advances. And this is the sheer love the sisters have for each other is something which actually tugs our heartstrings. It's something which we cannot miss, you know. And uh, Celia also tells us how she wants to become a man when her feelings are aroused on seeing Sugar Avery's naked body. So the lesbian love is evident, uh, although non-sexual, but it is present in moments of deep love. So Sugar Avery is the woman, you know, that um, Albert always, always loved and the character of the novel that Celie comes to idealize. It is only because of Sugar, the, the relationship that Celie and Sugar build with each other helps Celie to fight for her existence, even as a human. So that is what this novel is all about. Now, as I told you earlier, this novel is in a mode of letter writing, you can call it an epistolary kind of novel or you have the epistolary mode of writing that is engaged in this particular novel so we see red letters written by both Celie and Nettie are actually uh, we can say an excellent escape from their atrocities so when they go through times of pain distress depression writing letters become their only option Right? So they have only one option, that is to vent out their feelings through letter writing. So these letters are actually confessions of those uh, moments of powerlessness, where, you know, especially for Celie, wherein she has no one to talk. Like, you know, she has only God to talk to. And, you know, her stepfather keeps on threatening her. You better don't, you better not tell anyone except God. Because if you tell anyone, your, ma your mother will be killed. So that is what the threat, uh, you know, that's the kind of threat that Albert, um, not Albert, the uh, Celie's stepfather puts to, uh, puts forward, uh, you know, puts that, uh, uh, gives her, you know, that's the kind of uh, the threat that he 
uh, tries to frighten her with. So what Sally does is she tries to express her feelings by writing letters, and this is the kind of this was the best way she had to fight her depression. And uh, through this letter writing, she retained the minimal identity and freedom that remained in her. So it is, you know, we see it is a desperation to converse with someone understanding, like. Sugar Avery, or maybe her sister Nettie, that it is that desperation that makes her resort to writing. So, in the last letter of the book, you know, when we read the last letter, you see how she addresses it. In the beginning, she starts with Dear God, but towards the end, I mean, by the end of the novel, you see how she addresses her letter. Letter, she says, Dear God, dear stars, dear trees, dear sky, dear peoples, dear everything. So, you know, everything reminded her of her existence. So, why has Walker used the epistolary form of writing? See, uh, Walker's use of epistolary form has got a very serious purpose. Uh, letter writing is the only weapon that Celie has, has, right? And that is the only weapon she, she has. And that is the only weapon through which she can fight this battle against patriarchy. So, this act of letter writing develops the sense of selfhood in her. So from the very beginning, she is raising her voice against all the oppressions that she undergoes by writing letters to God. But you know, her voice was not loud enough to let others hear, you know, the others could never hear her. She was always, you know, uh, like she tried to speak, but nobody could hear her voice. So, uh, and in the in between, she, she even doesn't get any response from Nettie, right? But later on, when she realized, so she she thought that Nettie was dead. But when she gets to know that her younger sister is alive and Nettie has got all the letters that she has written to her, she actually gets courage to make her voice louder, right? It is then that, you know, she starts, she gets so antagonistic towards Albert or Mr. Dash who has hidden all, all of Nettie's letters to her. So she starts, she slowly gets this courage and then, you know, she has this, she tries to express herself. Her voice becomes very loud. Till then, nobody could hear her voice. But from then on, you know, her voice becomes loud that people can listen to it. She changes that recipient of her letters. You know, she shifts from God to Nettie. And from there, she finally addresses the whole world in her last letter. Right? So we can see that the women in Alice Walker's novel, they don't just celebrate their own sexuality. They challenge and they reform their domestic situations, their relationships, their codes of conduct, the values of their world and all that. So uh, when we look at traditional epistolary novels, we understand that heroines would be very submissive, very submissive to patriarchal control. Or they would, you know, uh, conveniently die before, you know, before that time, before that time, I would say. But here in this particular novel, we see that neither Sophia nor Sugar Avery submit to patriarchal control. And both women quite determinedly refuse to die. Despite near-death experiences through assault or serious illness, they would not die. They are very, very strong. They refuse to submit. And the main protagonist, Celie, okay, we will say that, of course, she does submit to patriarchal control in the beginning. But as the novel progresses, we understand that Celie also undergoes a very significant personal change. Uh, from being a victim of patriarchy, Celie evolves with the help and support from a very strong group of like-minded women, like Sugar Avery, like Sophia. And she develops, so she, and I can say she blossoms into an independent, sexually liberated woman who runs a successful business. And then she even takes charge of her own property. She discovers that she's in control of her own destiny and she is not bound to a life of crippling injustice at the hands of men, right? So that is about Sili. So Sili, this, this novel is an epistolary novel, but it's a bit of difference. The, the, uh, the protagonists or the characters in this novel do not submit to patriarchal control. Like, like usual uh, heroines, or you, you can say usual women of, uh, you can, uh, we can say the traditional epistolary novel, right? So the letter writing initially is a way to vent her frustration, vent her problems, uh, vent her, the, the kind of pain that she feels in her mind. So first she writes to God, later she becomes louder, so she starts writing to Nettie, and finally she addresses everyone.
right then one more aspect i would like to discuss about this novel is this novel color purple is a womanist text now uh, there is a kind of difference between a feminist and a womanist so uh, alice walker has uh, tried to uh, portray this novel or portray the concept of womanism in this novel so how do you kind of uh, distinguish between feminist and womanist because walker prefers the term womanist rather than using the term feminist she says womanist so it's very important she has used this term womanism um, alice walker right so it is very important to understand this when we study this now because a traditional feminist reading uh, would certainly you know make us understand we will we'll come to know the inequality between the sexes the injustice of domestic and sexual abuse women struggle for recognition as individuals who deserve fair and equal treatment so these are all consistent themes within the narrative so that would be a traditional feminist reading of this novel but walker as a womanist goes much further and her goal is much more specific you know in that she is committed to exploring the oppression the insanities the loyalties and the triumphs of black women so uh, it's not just walker you have other uh, black women like toni morrison who have also recognized the plight of the african american women who suffer from this i would say double marginalization of racism and also sexism right so you know uh, these writers these black writers uh, would always say that this black woman had nothing to fall back on she did not have maleness she did not have whiteness she did not have ladyhood nothing and you know it is out of this profound desolation of her reality that she would have invented an agency for herself so that is what these women say so this concept of uh, womanism walker's womanism stems from her mixed ancestry right so she perceives the notions of self and the other is she understands that it is revolutionary and she challenges the race gender and the class divide so uh, according to alice walker patriarchal society and its associated evils of uh, you know sexism racism can be only challenged by a womanist spirit of defiance so she says you need to have a womanist womanist spirit and this womanist spirit is a spirit of defiance right it has this unshakable desire for social integration so you know you you will defy you will resist you will be resilient to all the kind of problems that would dare to shake you so actually this concept of womanist uh, we can see her mentioning this in her pivotal work in search of a mother's garden a gardens a womanist a womanist prose so she defines the term womanist you know uh, in, in that so she says a womanist is a person who dares to speak out against oppression right speak out against oppression she would love other women that's why she speaks about the sisterhood of women she would uphold women a uh, woman culture she would be committed to the survival of the whole community she would love music dance uh, folk and herself so this is what alice walker would say when she describes the term womanist right so uh, this is actually this term womanist is from the folk term in of african american uh, tradition called womanish it is a folk term which is symbolic of boldness it's uh, it is symbolic of premature adulthood responsibility leadership it is kind of something that is very much opposed to irresponsibility and frivolousness so that is the african american term tradition right womanish and she has derived this term womanist from that so this particular novel has to be read as a womanist text because she here in this text uh, what alice walker does is she is committed to exploring the oppression the insanities the the problems at the same time the victories the triumphs and the loyalties of black women right so we have to understand this novel both from the feminist perspective and also from the womanist perspective so when you study this text as a reader you need to examine it objectively and also take into account how uh, the 
or uh, the ethnicity and the gender of these black women might affect the way in which the narrative is interpreted. So what are the kind of womanist aspects that we can see in this uh, novel? So we can say, you know, there, there are a lot of victimized females, right? So that is, uh, that is one feminist aspect, right? Victimized females. So a number of women are seriously exploited by men. And some of them from a very small age, like Sealy, being, and some of them, you know, they are expected to work in the home, labor in the fields, look after siblings. Sealy and Nettie were like that. And it was not uncommon. The second thing, it was not uncommon for women to be married off uh, by their parents uh, at a very young age. So Sealy is married off to Albert by her stepfather. And it's a very uh, cynical transaction. You know, the bargain is Albert had to give a cow to the stepfather to get Sealy. And another aspect that we see where women are victimized is that women are expected to submit without question to male sexual desire. There is no, there is no uh, question of consent there. Like sexual intercourse is always, uh, it should be based on consent, mutual consent. But here there is no question of consent. You know, Celia is beaten. She is, she is supposed to, like, you know, I would say it is a, it is a case of incest and it's also a case of marital rape right so if she resists then what happens she's beaten again so she's physically assaulted so that is again an aspect of how women are victimized then what about faithfulness in marriage or marital fidelity it is not seen as something that is very important by men right but what will happen if females or the women do not do not show marital fidelity or where they do not express marital fidelity? What happens? You know, it becomes a cause for censure, right? Now, here, uh, you, in one instance, you see, you know, the preacher in the church, he uh, badmouths sugar because of her loose lifestyle. But, you know, people like uh, uh, Celie's stepfather, People like Albert, they never censure in the same way. It's always the women who are always, it's always the women who are scolded. It's always the women who are looked down upon. So that is also one aspect of how women are victimized. Another aspect that we see is the violence uh, upon females by males. It's very common, right? And even in relationships which are very loving, see, uh, Harpo and Sophia were very, uh, were a very loving creature, a uh, couple. You know, they were very loving. They were very loving to each other. They were a very uh, loving couple. But you know, he beats her, right? It's because uh, it, it is. He's seen his father do that, so he expects Sophia to always kind of. Uh, look up to him and she's supposed to be very very submissive and you know a kind of doormat so it is a kind of acceptable way of asserting male authority now Harper does not beat Sophia because there's a particular reason because he feels that a woman is uh, supposed to uh, kind of look look up to a man and if she doesn't do that if he feels that she's not doing that he would beat her so, and he's seen his father do that. And this is acceptable. It is an acceptable way of asserting male authority. And another aspect that we see is some of the women in the novel learn to fight for them. So, so that is a womanist aspect, right? Some of the women in the novel, they learn to fight for themselves. See, for example, Sophia. Sophia is determined not to be subservient. But what happens because of her aggression, her marriage breaks, breaks down, right? Then she is beaten, she is imprisoned because she talks back to the white mayor. So we see on one side, it is sexism that kind of uh, puts her down. And on the other side, it is racism, right? But we see triumphant females in this novel, right? Women do succeed in resisting injustice. So that is the main aspect of womanism here. Women do succeed in resisting injustice by bonding together. We would call that the sisterhood of women. They help each other. So the bond of sisterhood is very important. So we see that between Nettie and Celie. We see that between Odessa and Sophia. We also see that between Mary Agnes and Sophia, Albert's sister and Celie. See, it's a kind of metaphorical bonding, right? Tashi and Olivia, Sugar Avery and Celie. Because Sugar Avery and Celie, they embody both roles, right? Sisters and as well as lovers in their relationship. And we also see in this particular novel, 
how some women are economically liberated from dependence on the males, right? See, uh, Sugar Avery and Mary Agnes, they establish independent, successful careers as singers. And they enjoy more freedom than any other whose lives are bound by the home, by work, by childcare, etc. Even you see Seeley. Seeley is empowered to establish herself as an independent entrepreneur. Why? Because she gets the support of this sisterhood. Right? Even some characters become sexually liberated by finding enjoyment in same-sex relationships. So we see Seely uh, and Sugar Avery uh, exemplifying much of Walker's womanist ideology. And it is their lesbian relationship that enables Seely to discover her own identity as a sister, as a friend, and as a lover. So, you know, the main aspect about this novel is that all the black women that is what womanism is all about you know all the black women in the novel they form bonds of mutual sympathy they support each other and that actually acts as a defense against the oppression of both blacks and the male and, and the whites you know and both black males and the whites so that is what exactly uh, alice walker was trying to prove while describing the concept of womanism, right? So what she says about womanism or a womanist is a person who dares to speak out against oppression, loves other women, upholds women's culture, committed to the survival of the whole community, loves music, dance, folk, and even herself. So this is how you see how Celie and the other characters embody the concept of womanism as Alice Walker has mentioned it or as she has voiced it, voiced it out, right? So uh, even, you know, see, we can also, yesterday I spoke about that, about the, uh, the significance of the title, the color purple. So Walker associates the color purple. It is an empowered, you know, lavender, right? With this empowered form of feminism. So color, the purple would be, you would say it is a, a deeper shade of lavender. You can say an empowered lavender with this empowered form of feminism. So womanism is an empowered form of feminism, just like purple is an empowered form of lavender, right? So in her vision, a sense of solidarity and sharing enables the blossoming of society and individual identity. Right. So uh, she, you know, uh, she tell, you know, I, I don't know whether you uh, remember while reading the novel, she tells uh, 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 Seely ones, I think it really, God doesn't like it when you walk by the color purple in a field and you don't notice it. You need to notice it because it signifies empowerment, empowerment and the blossoming of society, the blossoming of the individual. So what Walker started was a purple streak of womanist movement in the history of feminism and this novel is you can say uh, a very uh, you can say it is a very good example of this concept of womanism that alice walker has been trying to prove any questions do you have any questions if not thank you very much